All right, so let me uh, get started here huh? so that we have the full 75 minus 5 minutes of uh, the time we're allotted. Uh, we want to cover a lot in this uh, session on using client-based projects to enhance student learning. I just wanted to briefly introduce everybody on the panel. Uh, to my left is Nina Shapiro Pearl, and she is um, from uh, SOC and CAS uh, in the anthropology in particular. Um, then Greg Hunt, uh, who is from uh, SPA's now newly labeled Justice Law and Criminology Department. Uh, to his left is uh, Stephanie. Uh, Fisher, and she is from SIS. She is also um, in social, social entrepreneurship in the social entrepreneurship program and is the director of experiential learning. And then finally, uh, Malia uh, Brink, who is a new faculty at Justice Law and Criminology in the Justice Policy Office. So just so you get an idea of who you have in front here, um, I wanted to briefly outline what our goals are for this uh, uh, 70 minutes that we have together. Um, we would like for you to have some resources and contacts to uh, do it yourself, to use client-based projects if you so choose, but also to have a critical awareness of why using clients is important or why it may not be what you want to do. Um, and uh, uh, those two objectives we hope we can achieve with really many inputs that we have on the panel here. We'll each take turns uh, presenting uh, what we have uh, done in the past, carving out the little piece, and then we'll have a moderated roundtable where we each kind of focus on particular uh, topics and that should leave us with another uh, 20 minutes towards the end uh, uh, for an open discussion. Um, I would like to point out these evaluation sheets that you have on your seats that we hope you will get a chance to fill in briefly at the end shouldn't take too long. Uh, so let me then uh, hand over to Nina. Uh, she'll uh, present to you what she does in terms of client projects. Thank you, Sonia, and um, hello, everyone. So I'm a filmmaker in residence here. I'm um, in the uh, <coughs> School of Communication, Film and Media Arts, and in the Department of Anthropology. I'm an anthropologist, and I'm also a documentary filmmaker. Um, I teach two courses, one each semester. One is called Documentary Storytelling for Social Change, and the other one is called Community Documentary Stories of Transformation. In both cases, anthropology and film students work in teams and create short documentary style films for nonprofit organizations in Washington. Um, over four, uh, four years now, eight semesters, my students have created 30 uh, short films for nonprofits in Washington and uh, 30 digital stories, which are four minute self told stories made by community people who are not filmmakers and don't have a background in it and my students support them in that effort and we're going to look at a four minute digital story here today. Um, all of this, um, all of these student films are online on this website um, american.edu slash soc slash community voice and that is the name of the project that I build, have built and lead called the Community Voice Project. Um, the central question of both courses is whose voice gets heard in our society? And how do we assist underrepresented people to tell their stories without overwhelming them, without overwhelming the story with our own assumptions and preconceptions, trying to let the voice of the community person speak for themselves. So I came to this work after working as a filmmaker for 20 years, uh, documenting the stories of janitors and nursing home workers and home health aides and public employees like school bus drivers across the country. I worked for the Service Employees International Union, SEIU. And um, I met scores of nonprofit organizations, justice organizations in this area across the country who were doing very, very important work, but they had no time, no money, and no expertise to create a short film about their organization. And it was my feeling that the stories of the organizations could best be told by the people that benefit from the organization. If it's a, um, a food kitchen, let's talk to the people that, that come and use the food kitchen. It's much more interesting than 
in uh, interviewing the executive director. I'm not saying the executive director is not important, but in order to hear from people that we don't usually hear from in society. That was my uh, mission, and that's what the, com the Community Voice Project is about. So uh, given this background of mine, um, I left SEIU after 20 years, and um, I, I felt that I had more to share uh, with my experience, and I knew that film students are always looking for projects. And I knew that anthropology students are hungry to share their learning about larger social processes, of race and class and globalization and immigration and um, uh, sexual orientation, to share this with the public. And so I thought, well, what about creating teams where anthropology students and film students work together and share their skills in the process, learn collaboration, learn how to talk to somebody that's not another film student or not another anthropology student. Learn how to work on a team. I tried to model what it's going to be like in the real world, adapting to situations, managing a relationship with a client. I should say that I line up the organizations in advance so that the students don't spend half the semester finding somebody. Also, the, uni the, the, uni the organization has to be ready to receive the students. They have to have the capacity, and someone has to be the point person to be able to make this thing happen. Because it has to happen fast. I do an orientation in the class, and then over maybe the first two, three weeks where students get in touch with their own story and how to be sensitive to interviewing people, and um, then they hit the ground running. And so in about 11 or 12 weeks, they have to begin, do the work, and finish the project. Um, so um, the, I'm going to show you a story uh, in a moment, a digital story, but um, I would say that the purpose of this course is that students assist members in the community that we often don't hear from to tell their own story. And then that turns out to be transformative for the students themselves in understanding themselves better. And I really work on issues around um, uh, listening, uh, sharing, being present, um, what happens in an interview, the power that comes with a camera next to you, being responsible for that power, becoming a human being in that conversation, those kinds of things. So um, what I'm going to show you now is an example of a digital story, which is uh, different than a usual documentary style. It is participatory. That means that the community person, in this case a public artist from southeast Washington, because uh, I worked through the Anacostia Community Museum, uh, a public artist gather, uh, is one of 12 sitting in a story circle with me and um, uh, some students. And they talk about what they think their story is going to be. And then we kind of hone and think and push. And anyway, this woman came in with another story to tell, but this is the one that she ended up telling. I was born and raised whole, a cup of color and sound, dawn just before the sun, a ball of actualized potential and light. If there was sadness, it was eternally dismissed by the sound of needles kissing records, the smell of cooking with gas, the joy of finding puzzle pieces, a family who sat down to dinner, and a mother who prayed and prayed and prayed for this girl. I was born a girl, and that meant Daddy opened doors that I always saw first. It meant shoulder rides when my legs gave out. It meant extra eyes and protection. It meant something sweet. It was rag dolls and tea sets, books, secret nooks, and imaginary friends that my parents made room for. I was so free. Free to love, to live, to create, to explore. I was born brown and sweet, like glazed pecans. 
I was going home, and I was something to remember. I only remember the first time you found out. You were beautiful. I was 14 or 12. No. Honey, he was 28. A friend of mine, our play brother, whoever he was, he had I, I lost his attention. You were 14. I lost my key. You seem to have any steps. Oh, no. No, okay. you, you won't forget. I was washing my hands. I don't know. He stood behind me. Shh. I became undone. The pain was blinding. Everything got loud except for me. The water dripped. My flesh broke, the tears ran, and I, I can't remember. Just white walls, a white sink, a white tub, and white walls. I found my keys. There was silence. There was this blissful, deafening It is amazing how your mind will really trick you. When you suffer a trauma, you have to be careful that that trauma does not become your only memory. Trauma has a way of breaking you and making yourself seem bigger than the pieces of you that are left. The beautiful thing about my journey as an artist, I really have learned to celebrate the pieces in the process of re-memory. Putting the pieces back together is what allows me to never forget that we all have beautiful stories and beautiful families so much bigger than any pain that we have to make. And you can forget that if you're not careful. When I entered the world of visual art, color and the memory being back in my life, art allows me to remember in the most original sense of the word, to put back together again. Art gives my pain something to do, to paint, to write, to cut, to build, or to just shut up. Art keeps pain busy. And soon the hurt gets swallowed up in the joy of color and creation. The joy of collecting yourself and remembering. I am home. A full cup of color and a set home. Dawn rising with the sun. A ball of actualized potential. I love and love. departure too and I apologize for it I wish I could say I came to client based projects as altruistically um, because the truth is I, I didn't at all um, I came to teaching uh, as a working nonprofit lawyer um, from for many years um, at a couple of different nonprofits and uh, I I had a fellowship that originally started at one of the very big law firms. So I moved from a very big law universe into sort of smaller legal nonprofits. And um, the universal truth of all of those communities is that, that we are frustrated by the things that particularly young lawyers have no idea how to do. And in, in the law school world, I think part of that for me arose from this <coughs> dichotomy that exists between you have doctrinal teaching where a professor stands in front of a lecture hall and teaches, and you have clinical teaching which is basically pretend you're a practicing lawyer with professorial oversight of varying degrees. And absolutely nothing in between. And so I got really interested in the people who were starting to look at that <coughs> in-between world and saying, look, I never had an interest as a student in clinical teaching because I could not figure out why I was spending $30,000 to go be somebody else's lawyer, right, with what I perceived as very little oversight, which may have been its own problem. I wanted 
access to the professors. I wanted absolute involvement. And so I sort of shunned that, and I was interested in how to reach people who were like me and also give them some very practical skills before they started um, practice. And so I'm very new to AU. Um, actually, my first time teaching undergraduates <coughs> will start next week. Um, <laughs> but here's what I can tell you, because I have now done this at, at Penn and at Georgetown before coming here. Um, I, I, so I sat down with actually a big firm lawyer, very different legal universe, and said, what are the things you wish young lawyers knew how to do? And it's very basic skills, right? It's, God, could you make them not afraid to pick up the phone? <laughs> or interview someone, or know how to, like, why have they never heard of an interview memo? Um, you know, some, and, and if they've heard of it, why can't they write one that actually documents the things from the interview that I need to remember? Um, some very basic things. And so <coughs> I went into this and said, I'm going to teach a practicum on my area of expertise, which is <coughs> the Sixth Amendment and the right to counsel, but I want them to get out there and do it. And I want them to go into courtrooms and I want them to see it and I want them to have to talk to judges and prosecutors and defense lawyers and bailiffs and clients. Um, and and really push them out of their comfort zone. So I started thinking about, all right, what can I come up with that will allow them to do that? And, and I, I really come from my expertise is in suing the states for failure to provide appropriate public defense, right? And, and well, okay, those are $20 million massive class action lawsuits, right? That's not something you can teach in a class. They go on for 13 years. They never resolve in a courtroom. It's a big mess. You don't want to involve students in that. But here's how it starts. It starts by somebody telling you that public defense in a place is bad, and you go sit in the courtroom, and you watch, and you start talking to people and figuring out how bad is it. So I knew I could get students to do that, because all I do is dress in jeans and a Mickey Mouse sweatshirt and go sit in the back of a courtroom and try and go unnoticed. So that's really easy, right? You can go into any courtroom, sit in the back, and not change the environment. And so that was my starting place. I started by assigning my students to jurisdictions and saying, I'm going to talk about the right to counsel and we're going to read Supreme Court opinions saying what it should look like. And here's what I want you to do. I just want you to go into these jurisdictions. And it started as essentially a journaling process, process, project. Tell me what you're seeing. Tell me who you're talking to, and then let's take it one step further. Call them up, see if you can sit down for an interview, and give me an interview memo. And from there, it evolved into more specific projects that actually serve a client. One time, I thought to myself, well, you know, these guys in D.C. court, right, they really need some help. So I called up a judge, and said, who is the administrative judge, and said, if you could know something about what's going on in your courthouse, what would it be? What do you want them to look at? Because I have some pretty good minds. They're sitting around and they need to do something. <laughs> um, and that's how I started with project-based things. We started doing things like, you know, we have this real problem in D.C. Superior Court. We have investigators. We can't keep them. They all go off to the feds. And I can't throw money at the problem. I'd love it if someone could look at the situation and come up with, how do we keep them longer? Okay, I can do that. And in the course of it, they have to talk to all different constituencies. They have to think through the problem. They have to document their interviews. They have to go to court. And maybe they produce a product that actually adds value to something. And so that's how I came to it. And that's basically what I, what I do now. I mean, I'm, I'm a... Um, a research associate professor here, so I have ongoing projects, and what I do is I seek out, my course here will be about justice research. One of the first things they're going to do is there's a tiny little division in DOJ that helps other countries do particularly police practice improvements. And that tiny little office has had on its back burner the desire to create an eight-hour course for mid-level police managers, mostly in Latin America, on LGBTI issues. Okay. They're going to have to figure out a lot about where these countries are on LGBTI issues before they start thinking about how, you know. But they meet a lot of people in the process. A lot of it is brainstorming about how to approach it. And 
whatever it is for the client, it's an extraordinary value add because, like I said, this was a project that was on their back burner. <coughs> and it's, as she said, an, 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 uh, you, you learn teamwork, you learn division of labor, you learn research, and it's, it's an opportunity, and we call it applied justice research, right, to apply some of the skills that they learn from their more doctrinal classes. Not quite as altruistic, but it does some good. So the next, uh, I'd like to pass on to Greg. Oh. Talk about his experience. Uh, uh, my experience is similar to the Malia's. Uh, I'm a retired federal probation officer. Came to teach here after I retired. Uh, and one of the issues that I saw in the fields of community corrections uh, was the fact that most people didn't even know what it was. I didn't know what it was when I fell into it. Uh, and uh, if you spoke to students here at American University and you asked them if you're taking, if you're in the, uh, in our Department of Justice Law and Criminology, uh, they say, well, wh why are you here? Well, I'm either studying terrorism, I want to be an FBI agent, or I plan on going to law school. Uh, nobody understood that there was a whole field out there uh, that had great opportunities and where we <coughs> needed really good people. Also, I should say that as a person in the field, I had student interns and they often came to the field having very little understanding of the field. So my objectives as I developed this program, and because I had lots of contacts in the field, uh, I knew the various agencies, I knew various representatives, was to develop a program in which we place students with these various agencies. In addition, uh, a major problem in our society today um, is the fact that we have lots of offenders returning to the community. There are over 3,000 uh, ex-offenders returning to the D.C. area every year, over 60,000 returning uh, in the United States every year uh, who have done time in prison. AU, in its interest in assisting the community uh, with, uh, with issues, uh, we developed this program where students uh, would work uh, in these agencies uh, to assist them uh, with the reintegration of offenders. And you're saying, well, what would an 18 well, most of the students are, are, are either juniors or seniors or graduate students. Uh, what would they know? Well, we tied this together with a program, uh, tied basically off of the, the Law Students and Corps program, uh, where we train students in training. Uh, we teach them about making assessments, interviewing, uh, which is very important, uh, counseling techniques, identifying substance abuse problems, mental illness, etc. These are all things that, that students gain to having a better understanding of be behavior and of individuals in the, uh, in the um, field of community corrections. Also, as part of their, one of their major, because basically, uh, the work, as you may have all heard, is, is that we have more offenders than we have people you know, supervising them, uh, and, there's more, and there's lack of resources. Most of the resources go to prisons, and not to the community corrections. And so uh, we make a requirement that uh, each student work with, the, work with the, uh, their agency to develop a program uh, that will improve offender services. And so uh, part of this is that it helps that first the student begins to learn about community corrections and then it's actually a field that they found interesting. Uh, and uh, we have many of our, it's been going on for about 10 years now, uh, we probably have well over 100 graduates from the program. Uh, many of them are now in the field, improving the field. Uh, one of my hopes someday will be she's already a supervisor. Uh, hopefully she'll wind up running the, the place. They told her one day she will because she's an outstanding person. Uh, and, but basically it's getting them to develop an interest, understanding what the offender community is about, but also have an understanding of working with the professionals in the field. They gain that understanding of who's in the field, uh, how, how an agency works. And, and part of the requirement is for them to identify because we tell it, okay, what you have to do is you have to go look at the agency and what are its goals, what's it supposed to accomplish, what are its objectives. Okay, 
what are they doing to reach those objectives? Are they not, and actually have to write a paper about this. Are they doing things that actually reach their objectives? Uh, it's basically a critical uh, analysis so that when they go into the field, <laughs> uh, if they go into the field, uh, uh, they will be able to improve it. Uh, but they learn how to work with uh, individuals in the field. And, and part of developing, because everyone thinks, well, you know, you work within your agency. I'm a very big, what we call open systems. Let me let's start teaching that. Uh, but uh, open systems is where the, it's out in the community. The crime, criminal I issues are in the community. They're, they're not inside an agency. And no in agency is going to be able to cure them. So we have students who have to, they have to work with agencies outside to develop these projects. Uh, and I'll just give you one, which is my favorite uh, project. Uh, it was a student who was placed with the Virginia <coughs> Probation and Parole Agency in Arlington. And she was, uh, she, she was bilingual and she spoke Spanish fluently. Uh, and so she was placed with an officer, uh, the Hispanic population is increasing drastically in this area. And she was placed with an officer that had basically Hispanic uh, offenders on supervision. And she noticed that um, the problem, one of the problems was that, uh, and, and these were some, a lot of them were new immigrants, uh, is under domestic violence. The women did not know their rights, they didn't know what to do, uh, there was no information provided uh, to these women. Working with her agency, she developed brochures uh, and information packets uh, that she then was able to, to place at places like uh, the welfare office, immigration office. Uh, she went to apartments and, and provided this information in Spanish, knowing what a woman could do if she's being, being abused. So these are the kinds of things, working with a community, working with fellow professionals, understanding uh, corrections, and, and basically providing uh, you know, because most of the students will tell you they feel good afterwards. I, I have a short, nowhere near <laughs> the, the, the video that, that you saw, but just to give you an idea of how some of our students, and I don't know how to get to it. Should we also, because I know, I know it's about student benefits, shall we maybe put that into the discussion and afterwards and wrap up our Okay. Okay. We need some help finding the other video, but not quite. Yeah. But you will not work. Let's wait till afterwards. Okay. Great. Because it's about the benefits and then time check a little bit here. So thanks for coming, everybody. I've worked at on three different types, very different types of client-based projects here at AU. So I'll just tell you about each one of them so you get some context. And actually, client-based projects are the reason I came here. Um, the, when we started the social enterprise program uh, at SIS a couple of years ago, uh, Bob Tomasco started the program, very interested in making sure that the walls of academia did not get in the way between learning and doing for the students. That just from the minute they walked on campus, they had contact and substantive contact with the outside world. So he asked me to come in and arrange projects for the first year master students in the social enterprise program. Um, but a little bit different in terms of really getting the students out of their comfort zones. That was a big, uh, big, a, a big goal. And also helping students uh, be exposed to something new that might be an interest that they've just never had the opportunity to explore. Um, also figure out what they know and what they don't know. Uh, so that they could figure out their next two years in terms of, gosh, this is something I'm interested in, but I need to get these skills, I need to take these courses uh, in order to be more effective at it. Um, and a big thing, to, uh, because of social enterprise, a lot of it is on startups, a uh, big goal of mine was to show students the chaos of working in the real world. Because even when we read a great case study, it's you know, so formulaic and always have, mostly has a happy ending and everything, but to really, you know, if you're in a startup, it's messy and students don't, none of us like that. Uh, so forcing them to be in something that they're not exactly prepared for and can be chaotic. Um, so that's the first kind of project I worked on and those were teams of two local nonprofits and startup social enterprises here in DC. Uh, second type of project, then I started teaching a course on NGO private sector engagement uh, at the master's level. And I, because I come as a practitioner and not a lecturer, I said, okay, what kind of assignments can I do that play to my strengths? I was like, gosh, I know a lot of people in the area and a lot of nonprofits would love to just like 
here, uh, filling an unmet need, they want to understand how to engage with corporations better. So I paired student teams, these were about teams of four, with nonprofits to help figure out what corporations they could be partnering, partnering with and really make a case that could either be to that nonprofit of convincing them why they should uh, try to partner or to the corporation of why they should be partnering with this nonprofit. So they were actually delivering that presentation at the end to, um, to that client. Uh, of how they could do that, just as a way to demonstrate what they've learned uh, in a real world environment. And then the third is the most recent, uh, I'm glad Irving is here, because he's working on this, uh, as uh, teaching one of the sections, uh, the practicum at SIS, that's a two year old new option for uh, your capstone of uh, getting a master's. And these are client based consulting projects. There's 14 courses going on this spring. Uh, and there are vast different, different types of clients, everything from Defense Intelligence Agency, DOJ, Treasury, to some nonprofits, international development, corporations, National Geographic, uh, all sorts of different types of projects. So there's different professors teaching all of those. I'm overseeing it in terms of um, the travel grants, which is really a not the most fun part of it. Uh, we have very little money for that. Um, giving students, trying to figure out what sort of uh, additional um, help they need. And so we have some um, help with the students on presentations. I give them orientation at the beginning on project management and that sort of thing. Uh, and then also a lot of troubleshooting and working with the students. Uh, so one thing I've learned that, so I've learned a couple things out of that. Uh, what the students are looking for is very much jobs. And I always tell them that they don't, they don't very, you know, sometimes it happens, it's very rare that they'll get a job at that agency. But how is this going to look on my resume? You know, what are the bullet points that I'm going to get out of this? Uh, also the network, the professional network that's going to help, help them. Uh, and then also the students are looking for a project that really makes a difference because they say anything that looks like it's a simulation at the end of the, at the beginning of the semester, they get frustrated with. That this is like every other class I've taken here. I'm telling the professor something that he knows already and I have to make a case for it. Um, so they really want a client that really cares about this and I'm able to make a difference. And my project that I'm doing is gonna go somewhere and influence somebody and you know, obviously only if it's good, uh, but they can have those kind of aspirations that it's not going to sit on a shelf, that it's actually going to change change something. Um, should I stop there? Yes, yeah, sir. And Greg, if you would be clicking on that PowerPoint there, I'm going to keep myself in check. Just the Where one is that's it? open. Yeah, the one right that's here. Just, just click on it. Yeah, click on uh, okay, it. Okay, here we and go. And then could you uh, uh -oh. open it up so that I can use my clicker? Okay, wait, wait. Right. Um, do you please? <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> there you go. So oh, there, there it is. is. Okay. okay. So I'm talking about the Masters of Public Policy program that we have, which has a practicum capstone, very much like Stephanie just explained. They're very similar, actually. Um, why <coughs> we do this uh, very uh, easily, uh, we are required to do so um, by our ac accreditation process, that we have some sort of comprehensive exam at the end. And we moved away from this comprehensive exam to then replace it by a practicum, again, very similar to what Stephanie just explained. Um, there's a couple objectives to that. Uh, we want to know that students are able to navigate and master a wide variety of analytic skills that they have and substantive knowledge. They need to test, we test that, uh, but also put it into practice. And through these practicums, um, we also want to test whether they're able to deliver work that meets professional standards in both form and substance, um, that they know how to document format, that they connect uh, theory to practice, and that's a big challenge to actually get them to go beyond just doing something that they could have done in the beginning uh, of their program, uh, that they work and manage deadlines effectively, as well as work in teams and distribute that workload fairly and efficiently, both leading and being delegated to. Um, so part of that practicum is that group client project that I talk about here, uh, which accounts for about two thirds. It's really the major chunk of that practicum. There's a couple other things that go into it but um, uh, that's mainly the, 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 the big piece of it. The clients are government agencies, nonprofit organizations, sometimes advocacy and interest groups, uh, so not usually corporations, um, as just outlined. Uh, how uh, EI survey interests among the students or uh, whoever teaches it, uh, and then uh, matches students up with clients. They can choose first, second, third choices, 
but they're largely assigned a client, so they can't go out and uh, very similar to what's been said before, Malia and I think everybody really, we're trying us as uh, uh, Nina as well as instructors to go gain, uh, get those client projects and then give them to students, but here with a certain uh, survey of interests first. Uh, in our case, students can switch around in sections to you know, find the project that they want to match up with. Um, they uh, start usually in about the fourth week of class, as early as possible, but not quite as early as what Nina described. Um, then their deliverables are due about the tenth week and by really the final fourteenth uh, uh, week of class. So these are block classes. Uh, they are presenting their final work either in the classroom or directly on site with the client. I have on the right hand side a couple of um, points how I evalu evaluate them. Analytic quality is a big piece. Um, the ability to work with the clients and to, to craft the demand to bring them down. Sometimes the client's demands are like way too big and so you have to kind of help the students craft a statement of work that actually uh, fits within the context of this course, but also within the context of many of them are last semesters so they work. So they have to be realistic about how much time they can put in. We can tell, you know, you have to work for 10 hours on this but there's not much more that we can squeeze out of them so they have to be realistic about what is a, what they're able to deliver, uh, the quality of their presentations, and then it just generally the professionalism at all levels. Uh, there's some peer evaluation that goes into this um, as well. Uh, here's just an example, so again, an idea that's a, a team that worked with, uh, as you can see here, GAO, uh, and their uh, final report is the Federal Energy Efficiency Subsidies uh, since 2005. This take, took place in 2011, so they kind of uh, developed a survey on behalf of the uh, of GAO. Um, and uh, their statement of work, just very briefly, was um, uh, to work on behalf of GAO, uh, which is uh, a task with identify, consolidating, and eliminating duplicative programs. So it was in the budget crunch that they were supposed to figure out how basically to use uh, federal dollars better to target um, uh, energy efficiency in a way that uh, doesn't duplicate and doesn't overlap and doesn't give. Uh, windfall profits to both individuals and corporations and utilities in particular. Um, and so they had to gain, you know, uh, 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 information that would answer a lot of those questions which you can see are really, really big. Uh, what does uh, the federal government provide actually in terms of those subsidies? What federal programs and subsidies have been added since 2005? What goals are there? Um, uh, what tools are used for there? What, what are the costs of those programs? Uh, uh, do these goals align or conflict and are there duplicatives somewhere? How do they do in terms of effectiveness? This is huge. I mean, this is a big program. We're talking uh, a student group of uh, four to five, but even for them, uh, for a semester, they have to work on paring this down, making it realistic, and that's a big chunk. Uh, just to show you briefly what they came up with, they actually delivered their work as a, um, uh, an Excel spreadsheet, something of a database where they um, uh, listed all the programs and uh, uh, put notes in terms of their costs, whatever data they could find in terms of their effectiveness, and then complemented that database, which really took them, I would say, 80, 75, 80 percent of the time was spent developing the database and then an accompanying memo of about 25 pages that then analyzed and made sense of that database with regard to the questions that were asked in the beginning. Um, so that gives you uh, an idea there, and you can just turn that off and then we'll go into a yeah. discussion round and you can open it up as you as you wish. And yeah, well I think one of the one of the big questions is right, it's pretty obvious what the, the nonprofit groups get out of this maybe, but we'll right I think we all go into this as teachers thinking about the benefits to 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 the students. So maybe if you want to show I think your your video goes oh, to this that was um, these were a couple of students that are now since graduated from here, one of them I think has just graduated from the law school here, uh, who participated in our program. Uh, I was filmed by me, so, and I'm not a filmmaker, <laughs> so. He does help. The bottom left. Bottom left. So the arrow or the bottom, very bottom. Little. Very, very where, where uh, you see it? Oh, the, oh, yeah, you have to be a little higher. Yeah. Uh, there it is. Okay, there we go. <coughs> this was taken here. She's the one who graduated.
She's the one that was um, now a supervisor, probation officer. actually do the assessments of it's a requirement of all the students to work with offenders I just wanted to give you a feel for what our students are getting out of the projects um, that they they do in the community, and they by introducing them to these projects, they then uh, see the the relevance of a possible career in it, but also of, of accomplishment. The one young woman who just graduated from law school, uh, uh, she's going to be involved in uh, uh, defending individuals who were wrongfully convicted. So it's. That's the kind of thing that, that we hope to accomplish by right? working in projects in the field. Sure. Um, so about what, you, what your goals were when for the students, yeah. Um, so the I talked a little bit about the, the goals for that plunge, the, the first thing I was talking about uh, in terms of out of the comfort zone and, and teamwork and learning new things that they want to do. Um, the practicum, because it's a capstone, it's probably very similar to what Sonia does, has um, certain learning outcomes that uh, are across the board. and. We're I'm surveying the students at the end of each semester to see how well we're doing it because the SETs don't always capture that. Um, but a big thing is teamwork, um, and that's um, that's a really tough one because uh, it's really hard to get a gauge from the students of how well it was going after the fact because students don't really have an incentive to trash talk their peers. Um, but uh, at times they do come to me or to the professor to ask for help on it and we've had to do a couple interventions uh, on that uh, which is always um, fun. Um, the project management side, uh, that's the thing that I think they learn the most in retrospect honestly, the ones that had really painful final days and they realized that it's because there was a failure in project management and the planning side as well as um, just the execution part of it. Sometimes they blame the professor for that, <laughs> but uh, these are supposed to be very much student-run projects, so the professor is constantly in this difficult situation that I want this to be student-run, yet I see them heading for some, some issues here. So at the beginning of each semester, I have an orientation that I bring in students from previous semesters to talk about where their pitfalls were, and often they'll put the project management side uh, and, the, and just say, we were up for two all-nighters because it, we just weren't where we needed to be and we had to, uh, so it was great. You know, lately, up, that's been getting a lot better. Um, I'd say the client relations, diplomacy side, uh, that's a really important uh, things that students get out of it. Uh, the problem with that with a team project is I think it's easier from the client side when they have one point of contact. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do encourage the students to try to delegate the different roles within your team. So maybe there's one person that has the professor contact, although anyone can contact the professor. Someone that has the client contact, someone that's responsible for you know putting together the annotator a bibliography. You know, trying to share enough that can be shared, but when certain things that make sense for one person to be doing it, um, so one student really wanted to get project. Um, people management skills out of it because he wanted to get a promotion in his job and he realized that that's what he needed. So he asked his team, would you mind if I'm the project manager for this? And they said, great. And uh, he could put that in his uh, resume and um, he did get a promotion out of that, so that was nice. Um, and then there's the, the critical thinking. Um, and I think the best part of the critical, and I was just in that uh, lunchtime conversation about critical thinking, the best part of this is that you really have to understand the point of view of the client because you just can't do a good job on these projects when you are just, this is a project I have to do. And that's the key thing I'm trying to get across to the students and I teach a consulting skills class also is that it's not about the project you do or the deliverable you do, it's about the value you create for your client. And you always have to be thinking 
not about the thing, but about the benefit, because it's so easy to do a beautiful project like that. Um, that database could be wonderful, but if it's not what the client needed, it just it, it missed the mark. So always be thinking about, you know, from the eyes of your client, what do they need? What is really going to help them? And asking them all these questions that they wouldn't think of telling you the answers if you didn't ask it. But just to really get in the in the head of your client. So I think that critical thinking aspect, if um, you know, it, if it's nailed home which I hope it is, it's nailed home really well. And the last part is about the presentations. Um, that we do try to give them some extra help in that because um, these are supposed to be very business-like communications. We only give them 15 minutes to do their presentations uh, when they do their on-campus um, presentation. They usually have longer with the client. Uh, and I get pushed back from the students, how am I supposed to put all this in 15 minutes? Like, how often do you have more than 15 minutes like, to talk to someone that really cares about what you did? Um, you know, often you don't have more than two minutes uh, if you're in an interview to really talk about one project. So that art of being able to summarize and sh figure out how to say the things that are most important, I think is a really important one. So we do have those 15 minute presentations. Yeah, and just to build up that, I mean, one of the things that I think is really important, you know, it all goes to professionalism, right? But it, it is the case that anyone can contact you and you have students who contact you as many times as they want to contact you because this is that environment and they're allowed to do that. Um, and the only thing they're worried about is whether annoying you too much might negatively affect their grade. <laughs> but when it comes to a client, right, there aren't do-overs. And learning that and driving it home and you do the initial interview with a client and then they always come back to me and say, but now we have these 17,000 follow-up questions that we'd like to ask. And you have to say, that's wonderful. You have to get started without the answers and maybe you'll get a chance the next time they can come meet with you, but you can't call them 17 times every time you figure out a follow-up question you might want to know the answer to and get some additional direction, right? Yeah. I try to do, um, if the client's willing, a once a week check-in with the client. Not all clients want that. Um, but even if it's a 15 minute phone call, uh, and often when I'm talking to potential clients, they'll say, oh, I'm not sure how much time is this gonna take for me? I say, well, how good a product do you want? If you don't want a good product that meets your needs, this won't take any time at all. <laughs> but if you want something that's really gonna be useful, put the half an hour a week into fielding, you know, not just, because answering a million emails would really kill me, but if they know it's a half an hour a week that they're going to try on things, um, that can be really helpful. This may lead very well into a topic we wanted to touch, which was selection of the client, right? Mm -hmm. You've all heard that we select the clients. What does that process actually look like? What goes into it? So, so you can I ask you to start us on that? Yeah, so I kind of thought about, we have lots of things to say on each of these points, but I really focused on what um, uh, uh, critical questions go into the selection. I think the, the, the question for me is like, what kind of clients? And then you see some differences here. Uh, Nina has a lot more community-based clients and really, you know, the doing good part is important. Uh, uh, Malia, you have a lot of clients that you actually want people to then engage with in their professional life and maybe make a difference there. And then maybe uh, Stephanie and I and uh, Greg to some extent are more like, you know, these are, uh, uh, we want to sharpen, yeah, actually there's some community learning there too. We want to sharpen the skills for our students and then pick clients in accordance with that. Say, I pick that example of GAO because we truly have a lot of students who go work with GAO, not because of those client projects, but because of the skills they have. So I try to expose them to the types of clients that they might then later work with. Um, but I also um, I have some ethical considerations that I want to throw out there. Um, if we start pulling in corporations, these students work for free. Not only do they do that, they also pay tuition uh, to do this. Um, so I really find myself sometimes in a conundrum uh, ethically because I feel like they're paying uh, to do then free work for uh, organizations. And indeed, some universities actually charge, GW for example, actually charges for these kinds of projects and with money going back to the students. So do not um, uh, uh, get into that uh, uh, sort of difficult corner. I really try to focus on clients and on type of work within their organizations that wouldn't otherwise get accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, I think the extreme case here is Nina's uh, where simply these organizations wouldn't do what you do. Um, and in my case, I get into areas where I feel like, gee, you should have paid us for this. Uh, <laughs> uh, but mostly, I try to stay clear of it and, and, and to ask them specifically to give us projects that sort of are piling up on their desk that wouldn't otherwise get accomplished. Um, uh, so that's that's one big chunk can of that. Can I just address that one issue yeah. about being paid? Often students will say, well, you know, I, I really, you know, think I ought to be paid for this. 
uh, and I have uh, a different perspective on this. If the student is paid, the organization, most organizations who pay, will be giving students things like, I'd like you to do the copying, I want you to answer the phones, I want you to mail letters. Uh, when they are paid, it's an educational experience and they're only, and our program requires that they only do professional <coughs> kinds of activities that professionals do. Now, a professionals doing, you know, s s some filing or whatever, that's fine. But they're they're, they're going to be there for as professionals, and that's you know a requirement for them uh, to be there in the first place. So this is what I tell students because if you're there, if they're paying you. They're going to expect you to do whatever they want you to do. And, <laughs> and it may not be critical. professional. You can have a critical distance in, mm -hmm. in working with I, them. If yeah. I could just jump in. I, I look at this a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. I see American University as a very wealthy organization um, in Northwest Washington. And then there's the rest of Washington, Greater Washington. And I think it's our obligation, and it's part of the mission statement of American University to be involved in the larger community, mm -hmm. to be engaged in the community. We're trying to teach our students about justice and in, at home and in the world. And so I enter into these relationships with the idea that money is not going to be exchanged, that it's pro bono. What we're giving them is for the good of these organizations that otherwise wouldn't have a short film to put on their website or to use for orientation or to train volunteers. And the students end up getting more, I believe, than the organization does in terms of suddenly a path that a filmmaker may never have thought about before of doing social advocacy work or that an anthropologist develops skills, film and other skills that they didn't have before and it turns their career in a different direction. So I <coughs> Bless you. Um, I just I feel like money mucks it up and <laughs> um, and uh, that we should really um, be about giving back to the community because you know there's tremendous need out. Kogat yeah. does get money for their consulting projects, mm -hmm. but only from the corporations, not from the nonprofits. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry, before we get to Q&A, we just had a couple topics oh. we want to run through, and then I promise we're going to have time. I, I say that I looking at the clock. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the, the last thing, Nina, I think you wanted to address some teamwork. Um, stuff which Stephanie raised. If mm -hmm. you don't want to and you want to go to Q&A, we can um, let it go to Q&A. Yeah, let's go to Q&A. All right. Mm -hmm. Hit it. Uh, just based on uh, the uh, some of you said, um, you know, I've been, you know, I've been through some of these classes, and um, I really enjoy every time, you know, getting into the community. But I, I also watched some of my fellow students sort of sweat this out. Some of them get lost it, it over, because they become overly ambitious, or the, there's a sort of uh, decline. It's like the real world is so much different in some ways that they want something. It's, the communication is horrible, whether it's someone's fault or not. And, and sometimes, it, you know, like you said, that you have ten weeks. Those weeks go by fast. And what can you do to prevent, like now, you know, now that I'm become a teacher, what can you do to prevent like that disaster from happening? You know, when they kind of come to you at the end and go, oh my God, you know. Can I go first? So, um, what I find is that um, the students are encountering many of the same problems when they go to start working with an organization. Like I, I can't reach this person, and they're not calling me back. Um, there's uh, you know, uh, when we went to do the interview, uh, the sound wasn't working, whatever the issue may be. And my, my uh, experience shows me that um, if we bring the problems back to class and brainstorm solutions, um, they learn from each other. And, and, and I'm not, as I, we talked about earlier, the sage on the stage. You know, it's like the... the um, guide on the side. So uh, they learn from each other and, um, and, and I think that that's, that's important. I was going to say something else. Um, and I uh, also, there's a, um, I'm really present. Like I'm, they're managing the relationships, but I'm on top of it. So if I know through a journal that they've written or something that comes up in class that there's a problem, I'm on it. 
first dealing with them and then dealing with the nonprofit if I need to. You know, so I'm very engaged, but okay. I still let them lead and build, and that's the experience. I'm trying to create um, a real world experience for them without an exchange of money, but pretty much otherwise managing um, problems that come up. Well said. M maybe a couple of things that I do, because I've also run into this, and over time I've learned a couple of tricks. Uh, one is to require them to assign roles. So they have to give me a sheet and say, here's a project manager, here's a contact with the client, here's a timekeeper, here's a minute keeper, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And here is a platform that we're working on. So I require them to use a platform, be uh, Blackboard groups or Google groups or uh, something else. And I say, I want to be on that. Um, every time I'm not, somehow it goes wrong. <laughs> when they don't have a platform, it certainly goes horribly wrong. I don't really check in, so I'm probably not as active as Nina describes it, but I'm that looming uh, <laughs> shadow of hierarchy, I think, that, that they yeah, have yeah. to ultimately report to. Right. I laugh, you know, you call it throwing people into the deep end, right? When they go out into the railroad, you throw them into mm -hmm. the deep end. You know those pools that they have for kids that sort of slope <laughs> down? <laughs> right? That's the goal of this class. Like, to me, that's the goal of the class. So what we're doing is trying, I mean, at least I see it as trying to teach a lot of the the steps that nobody talks about once you're in the real world. You have a project and you have a goal and, and you somebody tells you what the end result is. But the how to get there is the part where sort of people flounder. And I agree with Nina, the bulk of my class time is what are the interim steps you need to do from A to B? How are you going to get them done? Where did the hiccups arise? How are you going to get over them? Right? And, and it's letting them talk through all of it and sitting on the side and where you see, oh look, they just jumped over that and there's a lot of murky water there. <laughs> Going back and saying, wait a second, can we go back for a second because I don't understand and asking a lot of questions about how they're going to do stuff so that you never get to that point you described where it's a week from the end and they're nowhere close to the deliverable. Yeah, I just add one more thing to that. Um, and we learned this the hard way. Uh, we had a, a professor that was criticized by students at the end because he didn't uh, give enough feedback to the students. And I heard from the students, they're like, he didn't even read our uh, rough draft. And then I heard from the professor, he said, he gave it to me the night before the you know the client presentation. They had to that was ridiculous. You know I had to show them a lesson basically that they can't expect that. I had no warning. Um, so I strongly encourage all the professors to require their students to have a really tight work plan at the beginning, listing all the milestones, which then is shared with the client. So then, because often you need client feedback at certain times, and the client might know they maybe they're in Israel, you know, for that week. Um, so making sure everyone has those on, you know, on their calendars when there's uh, milestones due, and then using the class times to report against how things are going towards the milestone, and then just really uh, getting in their heads that they own this. You know, this, they are the project managers for this. They own it. They're gonna have a great, uh, someone that their client will either think they're the best thing or the worst thing mm -hmm. based on their performance here, which is often a bigger incentive than just their, their grade mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> for the grad students because mm -hmm. no one knows about your grade off it, but you know, this is part of your professional network. I want to make a, I don't know, a contextual <coughs> observation, something that I've learned today which we've talked about before. I mean, this is a university academic and um, Traditionally, academic is theoretical, is, is research, and um, I know that Dean Goldgeier uh, in the School of SIS has very, very specifically tried to make a distinction uh, at the um, undergraduate level, the graduate level, and the PhD level. That is, even in, in a school like SIS, he wants the undergraduate students to have a liberal arts education. He wants them to be broad and general. At the PhD level, these are the academics. These are the researchers. These are the people who dig down deeply and study particular things. At the master's level, that's the practical level. That uh, most master's students, when they get out of there, when they get the master's degree, want to go out and get a job. And so that the master's level in SIS is very specifically practical. Now, having said that, it isn't until um, Stephanie's practicum program that SIS has really gotten into 
when we say practicum, what do we mean? And for most universities, that's a tough thing to do. So I, 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 I thank uh, Stephanie for working on these practical programs, and this group here is interested in, in, in practical things. So we, uh, the other contextual thing is the difference between substance and process. I'm a great substantive guy. Uh, I know everything about foreign aid, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, now uh, when we're getting into practical works, how to resolve these things, that's something that even I have to, have to learn a lot. And therefore, I appreciate what Stephanie's doing. I appreciate what this group is doing. And it's a whole new thrust that you all have to we'll focus on. Then having said that, Stephanie, uh, I think that um, Sonia's early presentation on how to make evaluation, uh, on how to do scopes of work, your, your first two uh, slides were really excellent. They were getting down to the practical level. And uh, I would like to get a copy of yours, because I think that should be included in somewhere in, in, in the background, because you, it's getting down to specific elements you know, practical yeah. things. I would like to get it. That's an and, orientation. Yeah. And Moya, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to get from you a very simple <laughs> thing that you make. A document, an, an interview memo. Interview memo. You know, that's such a, you know, a simple kind of yeah. thing. I, I kind of conceptually know what it is, but I now want to get from you what an interview memo, I want to include it in the syllabus, or somehow sure. include it in the thing because the students conduct interviews. Right. And so these, you know, we're, we're, we're moving down to the hands-on operational things, and these are the hands-on operational things that the stu students in the practice of the have to do. There are lots of other questions. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll put that on Blackboard. Yeah. I have some very concrete questions. <laughs> um, I'm Jody Gann, and I'm, I'm new here teaching in public health, and we're teaching the public health capstone for the, only the second time. We had six students last year. I have 30. And so I very quickly had to arrange eight projects, mostly with people that I know in the field. Yep. I'm new to academia, yep. so I can count at least that they're going to get, and they have reliable people that will hopefully keep in touch and, and sort of take mentors. So a couple questions is, I had to put this together very quickly, that I have eight they completed templates, and I've got eight projects, but they're kind of rough. And I think part of it is for the students to really figure it out, but I have all the things in place, like a temp, like a task plan and things like that, and they have things that they have to create. But I, a couple things, and I'm going to offer technical assistance for doing an appointment with me and that kind of thing, so I just want to make sure I'm setting up for, for success. Um, but what you had said, I think Stephanie said about the project manager, like giving roles, <laughs> or some things like that, they're all going to share this grade. And so does uh, I had a thought about the roles and things like that. It's, you know, they're going to kind of divvy things up, but I didn't think about assigning one person project manager. Yeah. And how important it yeah. is, and how when you're sharing a grade. Yeah. Assessment in general, yeah. right? I can talk about how we. Thing. Yeah. One thing I learned a long time ago, because I do teams with all my classes, is the project manager keeps a log of the participation of the other students and they turn that into me. Wow. So if one of the students is not doing what they're supposed to do, they're in trouble. <laughs> so does the project manager then takes on a specific part of the project as well, I would assume, right? Well, they're, they're, they manage the project, <laughs> the project, but they also maintain, you know, who's doing what and reporting that. Okay. Did you the assumption that everyone will share the grade is interesting, and I actually sort of want to even go to that foundation point and just ask sort of what people what people do. Okay. Um, so uh, for the practicum, uh, we suggest having three components of the grade. One is your team peer assessment. One is your client, how they assess you as a group, and can shout out any particularly great or bad people on that. Uh, and the third is the professor assessment. So for the team assessment, I put up on Blackboard uh, a, a template that I've used with students um, so that you can give the same grade um, for that, but um, giving students a chance to say someone did a very good job or very bad job on it. But in terms of the roles, um, I encourage students at the beginning 
to understand what everyone's trying to get out of it. And if someone wants to get the project management experience, if they, and also be honest, if, gosh, I just had a new baby, and I'm going to, I'm going to find, I'm going to, uh, you know, post this one. And wouldn't you rather know that at the beginning than at the end? And there are, free riders is a problem, um, and hopefully that will come up in the team assessment, um, but it's better for everyone if, you're honest with what you're trying to get out of it, or you're going to put into it at the beginning. I have the team assessment form I put up on um, Blackboard that I got actually from another university, and then I have a client assessment form that the client assesses the students. So that's all in the Amphair and Blackboard. Um, a, a lot of our videos are also up, and uh, I just put the PowerPoint up. So. And I will get an interview memo and put it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This woman had a question for me. I just want to uh, just take off from the first thing, but how much of a pushback is there from professors who kind of think of you know, the academy must be just the academy and this is just students wasting their time that is they should be doing more research work and getting more out of their degree, or even from say, you know, peers from other universities. I mean, oh, you know, American is doing this, but you know, our students are more theoretically grounded, you know, so how much of a pushback is there from Tradition that I think the master's level, there's more of a push for doing practical projects, yeah. but AU wasn't the first on the list <laughs> of um, you know our peers to start doing it. Um, but I think definitely at the PhD level, that's supposed to be what Irving yeah, was talking about. Yeah, especially at the PhD level. And it seems to be the thing that, you know, a PhD is an ivory tower, but then not, not everyone who does a PhD wants to go out and teach. Right. You know, a lot of PhD people want to just get the skills yep. to be able to work in a industry mm -hmm. And wouldn't, I mean, yeah. are they plans to kind of, you know, try to push it into? I don't think there's, a, I mean, this is a really good point. There isn't a pushback, but I truly feel like there's some of my, my colleagues who think I'm doing the dirty work. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and there are many colleagues who have high respect and say, I would never do this. I could never do this. And others who, who probably don't have the respect and say, well, I'm writing articles for academic journals. And actually, one of the challenges I think that I'm still grappling with, and I have no answer to that, is how to connect it back to the academic, academic mission that we also have. I would like not to follow the lead, although that's, that's in practice what's happening, to say, oh, master's level is all about practice. Uh, one of the big challenges I have with my students is to, let, to have them reconnect what they do to what they've learned over the last 18 months. Yeah. Um, and that's really a hard one for them to crack. Um, so so that's really I, I, I'm a PhD student. SOC and yeah. I come with a lot of professional experience and I've come back to grad school to kind of contextualize my practical experience in a theoretical framework but I don't know whether I want to go back to my profession or go into teaching so yeah, you shouldn't be uh, I shouldn't have to like you know make that distinction yeah. mm -hmm. and it, is all, it always helps you like you know kind of when, when you go into your field work eventually and writing up that you have some kind of practical experience but it just seems in the PhD I can give you a very uh, concrete uh, thing that I grapple with is that my students know how to do research uh, using our databases at, uh, uh, at the university, at the library, OVs, and, and all kinds of ProQuest, everything. And they get to the practicum, and that's nothing but web links. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what, what is this? You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've yeah. learned for 18 plus months to do proper research and to, to, yeah. to apply that research, and now you feel like this is all rubbish? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that's really important. For, for me, it's really important to connect those and not to just separate them. Uh, Sorry, you, you, yeah, she's had a question for a while, and then we'll go here and. Okay, so um, I'm curious about continuity with clients. So they have this experience with a team of students, the students move on to other great things in their life, and you're left with continuing professional relationships with your colleagues. So same clients over and over again? What if are they're happy. some of the speaking <laughs> points? You know, what happens when your students disappoint? What happens when your clients disappoint? Right. How does that, how do you manage that level of it? For me, it's about project selection, right? Okay. If, if the client has a good project over and over that fits my criteria of it being a back burner project, right? Um, and and that its scope fits within the semester time frame. I mean, I, you know, I sort of have this mental list that maybe I should commit to paper someplace. <laughs> um, that that are sort of my criteria for projects. If I have a good one, 
and they want to do it again, I'm all for it. But yeah, I mean, if something's it, going great, I would definitely keep on doing it because finding new clients can be pretty time consuming. Mm -hmm. um, but if, you know, sometimes the clients, it's not working out. Either the students don't, aren't happy at the end of it or the client's not happy at the end of it and you don't find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you have the problem if the, cl if the client isn't happy with it. <laughs> Yeah. You have to be careful with that because you're going to lose that client if you send the wrong student. That's why I say you have to make sure that you're sending the right students to the right place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, and also that, like in my instance, people who would be potential clients are also potential employers, they're potential internship yeah. sites, they're, there's a layered relationship with the university that goes over and The reputation years. of AU okay. and yeah. your department is also mm -hmm. on the line. Yeah. Yeah. You send them a crummy student, <laughs> yeah. you send them a crummy student, and you've lost that client, and they say, "Oh, those AU students—they stink." Mm -hmm. you know, so that's uh, that's the thing. Equations. These are equations you built over the years. So you know, for three equations are on the line. Just ones from the team. Yeah. So um, the back burner idea is a great mitigation. Just are there any other little tips about how to mitigate that the risk of that? I think the hardest part is making sure it's. Um, it's important to the client, so they want to put effort into it uh -huh. because yeah. there's always so many priorities. Everyone's overworked, so that they care enough about it that they're going to put time into it, but it's not mission critical that if the students don't do great on it. So it's an added opportunity if they do wonderful, but no one's really getting hurt aside from time if it's, you know, if it doesn't do well. I think in, do in well. finding the client, you have to make sure that they feel responsible and a you know, mm -hmm. someone's a point person in the organization yes. that's going to deal with the students. Because our students, you know, uh, you know, credits on the line. They have to finish this by April 10th. You know, and uh, the uh, organization needs to understand the deadline. So I'm very clear in the beginning that they need to be responsible, but they have to be at capacity. There's great little nonprofits that really need help, mm -hmm. but if there's two people and they are flat out working on everything else, then I'm not going to, you know, ask them, you know. So it's, I, and I have other criteria too that, like, I want something visually interesting. Like we did a film about a senior roller skaters in Anacostia, mm -hmm. you know, and they reach out to young people. What could be more fascinating <laughs> than, you know? Seniors on roller skates, and, and it was a great film. But um, uh, technology training or something like that. That's you know, so it, it needs. To, uh, you know, if it's just an office, uh, it may be doing really good work, but it doesn't work for mm -hmm. me. Let me ask you take one thing. I, I do is I interview all my students, regardless of my classes. I interview them, find out something about them. So if I'm going to put them in an agency, I want to put them someplace where they're going to be happy. happy. You know, uh, and I usually go over several, I have several different, I probably have 20, 30 different places uh, that I can, that I've been working with over 10 years. And I know, you know, after interviewing the student, I can get, say, okay, these are three different, what do you, what do you what, where do you fit in, in this? You know, some people want to work with women, some people want to work with juveniles, some people want to work with substance abusers. So, you know, feel more comfortable. So, if you place the student where they would want to go, I think you're more likely to have success. Well, you have a question? Or they have one last or question because we're already over. Oh. Okay. Well, then we can do it after. We'll start. Um, I just want to thank you all for it. This is a really fascinating presentation. I work in our Center for Community Engagement and Service on campus, and I coordinate community based learning initiatives. Um, so, looking at the intersection of the classroom and the community. Um, at AU, we actually have a brand new community based learning designation for undergraduate classes, um, where if you're teaching an undergraduate course and you take on one of these client based projects or a direct service project, which is what sounds like you do a little bit more of, Greg, um, you can actually get a CV um, designated next to your course so students know what they're engaging in before they walk into the classroom. That's one of the things that we've seen is when a student shows up and finally realizes that this is what they's doing if they didn't know it ahead of time sometimes it, it serves as a shock um, and so I wanted to offer up our office as another support and resource for you all if you're looking into this work um, but also find out from you guys do you have any way <coughs> this semester one of the things I'm charged with is to track community-based learning that's happening on campus so anything that faculty members and students are doing with public 
um, in the public sector, which is what sounds like what all of you are doing. And other than that, I don't really know that it's super walking into this room. So do you have a mechanism or a presentation or something that maybe people who are interested in learning more about this can attend? I mean, the, anything that's designated as a practicum seems like there's a, kind there like a community based presentation or something. That there, there are all different schools who are very okay. decentralized. Yeah, no, no, this is really a, a and I was going <coughs> to name up on the Blackboard site for this particular session. Mm -hmm. There isn't, I don't think. You, you would be the central place for us, rather. My, uh, my class says we have a public screening. Mm -hmm. We will be invite all the people that have been involved in the film, you know, the people features in the film, the people that work for the organization. We bring them to campus. Mm -hmm. and we have a screening of the films in the Weschler Theater. And we have people, again, that are you don't usually hear from, talk about the experience of being in the film, what it meant to them. They bring their families. We have food. And then uh, the students also talk about what it's meant to them. So we're really just trying to cross the social divides mm -hmm. in all kinds of ways, which includes bringing people to campus that, and being on a university and being people in the audience looking at their stories. So no, it's, it's uh, exciting. At so least in the fall semester, our office has um, a community-based learning symposium. We do it for the first time last fall, and it will happen again. Um, annually, but it might be a nice way to bring the intersection of this work together um, where students and working members and community partners can share how they benefited through so, I'm to chat with all of them. I'm pretty impressed with the other people who are on this panel. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't well, know them before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>